You're listening to the Fashion Ambition Podcast, and I'm your host, Natalie Robin. The Fashion Ambition Podcast is all about bringing you the tools and strategies to start and scale your business or career in fashion through conversations with industry experts who have been there and done that. Whether you're a startup founder, a new fashion graduate, or a soon-to-be graduate like me, or you just know that a career in fashion is your calling, we have an episode to help you launch. Make sure to keep up with new episodes by following the podcast at The Fashion Ambition on Instagram, where I update you on new episodes every week. You can also find my blog on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and online at nomadandmode.net, where I write all about fashion and travel. You can find all of the links to connect with me in the show notes. So with that, let's get into the episode. This is Natalie and welcome back to the Fashion Ambition Podcast. Today I'm really looking forward to talking with Joy T. Arcand, who is a multidisciplinary visual artist, designer, and the founder of the jewelry brand Mad Auntie. Originally from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, Saskatchewan, Joy has an impressive portfolio which includes installation art, graphic design, and photography. She has had her work showcased in galleries across Canada and internationally. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the Sobe Award, one of the most prestigious awards offered to artists in Canada. Her brand, Mad Auntie, is a collection of laser-cut syllabics and words from the Cree language set in jewelry. So today, we're going to talk about the inspiration behind Mad Auntie, what creatives can do to build businesses around their work, and advice for new jewelry designers. So welcome to the podcast, Joy. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So you have worked in so many disciplines throughout your career. So I kind of wanted to get started with what inspired you to start Mad Auntie and how those different disciplines kind of played into you launching the brand. Sure. Well, I started out in my visual arts career after graduating university with a photography um, degree. So that was where I thought I would be spending most of my time was behind a camera. Yeah. And, and I did for quite a while. Um, and after I graduated, I started working at the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center in, in Saskatoon, where um, I worked as a graphic designer. And it was... It was really there where I began to merge my artistic practice with um, my language Mm -hmm. uh, because I was working every day with the language in in a visual way. So while the language is uh, a majority of it is passed down orally, um, my day-to-day interaction with, with it was through uh, reading and design and typography based. So I think it was there that I really fell in love with um, the idea of Indigenous graphic design and what that means and Indigenous typography and the um, immense history that I'm still learning about mm-hmm. the origins of our own writing system, which is the Cree syllabics. Right. And so that was around uh, 2007 to 2009, where um, I really got this education around um, language. And it just like, even though I had, I had, been learning my language my entire life I'm still not fluent but it was that immersive environment that I was really um, reintroduced to that love of the language that I had since Mm -hmm. I was a child so um, I think from there I, I started incorporating language into my visual art and then the the Mad Anti Jewelry line kind of came out and evolved from that as well, because a lot of what I was addressing in my early work with language was what happens when you um, when you see your language in everyday scenarios. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think is at the core of what Mad Anti is and strives to be. Is, is taking something such as uh, Indigenous languages and really uh, making them a part of 
our fashion, our everyday wear and, Mm -hmm. and bringing it out into the world where people can see it. And I think that's uh, what's been really exciting about starting this jewelry business. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like it's really um, taken off in the last couple of years. And I think part of that too is like you've done a really good job of conveying the message behind like the importance of those, the the importance behind wearing Cree words. And I was wondering if you had, if there's one thing that you've done that you think has really helped you to build that community behind the jewelry line. And, and if there's anything in particular that you found challenging when trying to convey like the significance of wearing indigenous words to like new customers who are just coming across it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, the, the success of, of the brand really stems from this, this resurgence that was already happening in the arts um, with uh, indigenous people, mm-hmm. you know, wearing cultural signifiers more in, in their everyday dress. And so it, I think I was just like riding that wave that was already happening. Um, and I think it just like took off because of there was that recognition. Um, Mm -hmm. and and it had a lot to do with the words that I chose, um, to highlight in my jewelry. I think it, it became kind of like, uh, inside joke Yeah, or, or kind of like, Oh, this is for me. This mm-hmm. is this is something that I've heard, you know, my aunties say to me. Um, I may not know my language, but I know these words because mm-hmm. these are the the commands that a lot of a lot of people grew up around hearing. So right. I think it touched on this like sense of belonging and and pride. And um, I think just existing on Instagram and and having most of my sales be through Instagram um, just goes to show like how strong of a presence there is at, uh, of indigenous artists and, and people on Instagram and using it to um, sell their works mm-hmm. and share works of others. So that, that was a big part of, um, I guess, just like knowing how to tap into that and, and use that as a promotion tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Since then, I've learned a lot more about uh, different uh, different ways to sell and market the jewelry. I've I know I can do a lot more, <laughs> but I've I've been um, pretty pretty. I don't know, taking it pretty easy on myself as the only person, like designer, Mm -hmm. web person, I'm packaging every order. So it's, um, I feel like sometimes there's a pressure to expand. And I think a lot of people, when you see a brand that is garnering some success, that there must be a team behind it. Yeah. And, uh, it's just me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've learned how to take time off, shut down my store when I can't mm-hmm. uh, do everything. Uh, so that's why my store has been shut down for a little while after Christmas and I'm just taking some time off. But I think, um, I think people are becoming more understanding of that, especially during the pandemic is, you know, taking time for yourself and yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's something that we've all like really fully understood this year that it's so important to kind of take that time and recharge for sure. Um, But you kind of touched on uh, something else that I wanted to ask you with like the learning to market and marketing through Instagram. Um, Because I think a lot of creatives and particularly if you start in, start off your career in fine arts or visual arts, um, you don't necessarily get that business training. 
Like mm-hmm. you, there's, there's a lot of really, really talented people that have a hard time marketing themselves and, you know, putting their products out there and being successful with that. So I was wondering if you have any um, advice or, you know, from your own experience, something you would tell someone who's maybe just getting started with marketing their own art practice, really? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's like the business side of stuff is something I'm still learning and I'm still not comfortable with. And that's mostly mm-hmm. around like accounting and numbers. And I think that's really yeah. common with creative people. Definitely. Um, <laughs> so, so I don't really have any um, advice there, except that if, if you are able to hire somebody mm-hmm. to do that, then but you should probably do that. although I know a lot of people starting out and myself as well couldn't afford to hire somebody else so that's why we Mm -hmm. often have to do everything ourselves um but once if you ever hit that benchmark where you can start outsourcing do it immediately yeah Yeah. (laughs) um but in terms of like marketing and just creating a brand like I think one of the most important things is to like be consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, try not to overwhelm people with too much variety. Even like I get caught up in that a lot is that I have so many ideas. I want to put them all out. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to sort of remember that like you'll have customers who are returning and you'll have people that are just finding out. So right. um, spacing out your sales that, mm-hmm. and your launches of new products uh, just to keep it like consistent and keep it like, I think less is more. And I'm trying mm-hmm. to remember that for myself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Especially if you're the, if it's like a one woman show, you really have to kind of pare down what product yeah. or how many products you're going to put out there because you also have to market and you have to um, yeah. like create the products too and, mm-hmm. and make sure people are, you know, do all of the branding, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important uh, also to like make sure the quality is there before the quantity. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've been learning that myself as well because of the materials that I use are very um, like it's laser cut acrylic. So it is like in theory, it's fast to make. Mm-hmm. And that, that is to say that the actual just cutting of the, the shapes and stuff Yeah, it doesn't take that long, but that doesn't uh, take into account the design, the many hours of like trial and error. Mm -hmm. Um, Because for me, I was learning the medium as I was going. So I'm constantly learning new ways to do things and better ways to do things than what I uh, originally started with. So Mm I think that's that's really a part of it too is just like being able to um just like get better at what you do at your yeah. chosen your chosen craft yeah and for sure. uh, learn from mistakes <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so speaking of mistakes um now that you're like a couple years into mad anti is there something or is there anything that you like looking back on you're like oh yeah I definitely should have done that differently um I think for me it was just taking on too much mm-hmm. um taking on too much with the business but also with like my life and trying to trying to package orders while trying to develop new products while also having a visual arts career mm-hmm. and you know at the time when we could travel I was traveling quite a bit yeah. and it really it really impeded on my ability to be a good um 
business person in a sense of like being there for my customer, making sure I was getting orders out fast enough and, but not being able to always do that. So that's when I found out my limitations Mm -hmm. um, and being able to listen to when I am pushing myself too much. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I think that's, that's about all I can really remember. (laughs) It was, yeah. Yeah. uh, Really busy. I remember feeling like really, really busy at certain points and Mm -hmm. I never wanted Mad Auntie to turn into something that I didn't enjoy doing. Yeah. So yeah, that's why breaks are, breaks are important too. So yeah, definitely so true. Um, And I think a lot of it comes down to streamlining, I think, Mm -hmm. like really figuring out what tasks are actually going to move you forward. And sometimes the only way to learn that is by like doing it and then trial and error, making mistakes and then realizing, Oh, like I, I wasted a bunch of time here or I should have like not focused on this. Um, So yeah, some of these things like you can, you can learn by, by hearing from other people. And then some of the things you just have to like jump in and see what works and see what doesn't. So is there anything like in particular, aside from, aside from like streamlining things as a business owner, like maybe related to the financial side of things that you'd wish you had known before? Um, yeah, like I'd sign up for um, business classes before mm-hmm. and um, they would never really get into the nitty gritty of like bookkeeping or like taxes. Yeah. So I still haven't really figured it out, but I eventually I did end up getting like a business number and, you know, charging taxes and Mm -hmm. filing taxes (laughs) under (laughs) a business name is something that I'm still like not a hundred percent confident that I'm doing everything correctly. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think my next step is to hopefully hire people to do that because I don't think that um, we have to be good at everything, every aspect of yeah. running a business. Um, so I'm trying to teach myself to not take on every aspect (laughs) and thankfully I am I am in a position now um where I I could if I wanted I think hire somebody to do that because okay um yeah I I don't really have much advice on that end of things except Mm -hmm. that if you can get help if you're struggling with it then that's probably the best thing you can do yeah for sure so outsource if you can. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely something that I'm like, lear- like an area that I'm learning about as well. And one thing that I've found really helpful is YouTube, like mm. YouTube University or like LinkedIn learning, really. Um, yeah. Those are kind of some low cost ways to, I mean, I'm still learning about those things too, but low cost ways to kind of learn about that, about that if you're education or your formal education isn't in like business or finance um so that can be a really good way to kind of get around that yeah that's a great idea I I think like yeah YouTube all the way for (laughs) for anything really (laughs) seriously so good um so I was wondering as well like in terms of like the manufacturing you talked a little bit about like the the materials that you use, laser cut, um, acrylic, but for somebody who's just getting started, what would you say should be the first step in manufacturing? Like, do you have any, um, maybe steps people should take in terms of finding materials or, um, yeah, sourcing just basically the things that are going to put the products together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for, for myself, um, I had a really strong foundation in design before I I even chose my material. Mm-hmm. So um, even as a visual artist, 
uh, the way I approach my art is what is it that I want to say and what's the best way that you can say it. So -hmm. that's why like maybe uh, one time I'll work in photography and then the next time I'll work in a sculptor. It's because it's the, it's the best medium for what you want to say. So right. the, the way I found laser cutting was through um, a local, our local library here in Ottawa has a makerspace. Mm-hmm. And I was just curious and I signed up for a, a workshop and it's completely free. So I just went down there one day and um, I had sourced some acrylic from, uh, uh, I think just like a sign shop here in Ottawa where they had scraps. And so Mm -hmm. really I started out just with like, it was completely free and accessible to anybody who just had a curiosity for any of the things they offered in that makerspace space, which was 3D printing, laser cutting. And so I just, basically I, I found this material, it's, it's laserable. Yeah. And then I was just like, what do I make? So the first thing I did was I went to um, my illustrator software and I started doing like my own handwriting. Mm -hmm. And I started just writing out like the first Cree words that came to mind, which were a was and a stum, which both mean go away or come here. So Mm -hmm. that's really how it started. And then I, I started researching on different, like other artists who were using that medium. And I started to see like, oh my goodness, they have all these amazing colors. Where are they getting these colors from? Yeah. (laughs) So then that's where I, because when I started doing it, I only had like a limited like black, white, um, silver. Mm -hmm. And then I found this place in Toronto, which is called Plastic Works, I think. And uh, I drove down there and all of a sudden I had access to like mirror purple like oh, cool. gl- glitter neon yeah. and then from there I was just like oh my god I'm now I need all of the colors <laughs> <laughs> so so I think it's just a a, a matter of like getting it ex- that like it just was that excitement of like oh wow like mm-hmm. I could I could do this this and this now that I know where to find these things and now that I know I have a place where I can go to cut this stuff. So it just like, I think it's just that keeping that curiosity and whatever first excited you about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And like now I'm, I'm still excited about laser cutting, but now that I've like, I feel like I've um, learned quite a bit, probably as much as I can learn for what I want to do with it. Now I'm like, okay, I want to do 3D printing now. Yeah. So that's where my next sort of interest is taking me with jewelry. So I've been learning or teaching myself during the pandemic. I've been teaching myself how to do 3D modeling myself. Okay. Oh, cool. And yeah, learning from YouTube. <laughs> I had no, I had no idea how to even start. Mm -hmm. because it's a completely different way of designing than in 2d which I'm used to so Mm -hmm. YouTube University all All the way way. (laughs) (laughs) and so my next line of Mad Auntie stuff is going to be a a line of 3d printed jewelry Mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about so it's just like following where your like medium takes you and where Mm -hmm. your interests are and if yeah like if you if you find yourself like oh like I've done everything I can with this one medium Mm -hmm. I feel good I feel satisfied then like by all means like try something different um That's why I I don't know if like I have contradicting advice where I'm like, (laughs) keep keep it simple, 
but yet consistent, but try everything. <laughs> so I don't know. Like I, I should follow my own advice more, but at the same time I have all of these interests. So like t-shirts and I do want to get more into like clothing fashion. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. I think that's like the nature <laughs> of being creative in general. It's like, you just want to try everything and yeah. like, you can't, you can't choose one, but yeah, it's just, I think it's, it's, kind of finding that balance for yourself and mm-hmm. and you know working on what you can work on when you can I also really like that advice of like like starting from okay what is it that like I want to say with mm-hmm. my designs and then like working back from that and being like okay what's going to be like the best medium to like convey mm-hmm. what it is that I want to say so in your case it was like the laser cut acrylic um and yeah I once I'm back in Toronto, I'll have to go check out what was it called again? The Plastic Works. Plastic Works. Yeah. yeah. That sounds so fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really just like in an industrial part of town where there's just like rows and rows of uh, different colors of acrylic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so cool. I um, I remember for one project at Ryerson, I was um, we, we didn't end up doing it, but we almost got into laser cut acrylic. Um, but yeah, so I, I missed that opportunity, but I think it'd be really cool to, to check out and also really excited to see, um, like what you come up with, with your 3d printing too. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm just waiting for some prototypes to come back. Um, mm-hmm. cause I use the site called Shapeways. Okay. where um, you can upload your design and you can order from like uh, any number of products that are um, like the the regular whatever plastic they use for 3D printing, but they also do mm-hmm. wax casting. So you can order stuff oh, in metals, okay. copper, silver, gold. Um, yeah. So I'm just like wow. waiting for the mail any day now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just standing by the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Well, I mean, you have done a few pieces in, in 3D printing, like the kind of the brass knuckled inspired mm-hmm. um, ring. And I think that was maybe the only one I've, see- I've seen so far. But yeah, very excited yeah. to see. I I did. Uh, I enjoyed doing that, but I had to hire somebody to do the, the file. Oh. Mm-hmm. And so this new stuff that uh, I'm prototyping is all stuff I've designed myself. I mean, built myself. I did design the ring, but somebody else had to actually make the Mm -hmm. file because I didn't know how to. Mm -hmm. Um, So all of this new stuff is, is what I've taught myself during the the panty. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we definitely all have like a lot of downtime. So (laughs) acquire some new skills for sure. (laughs) Um, okay, so my next question, um, and we're winding down here, but one thing that I really like to ask people um, is what one piece of advice they would give themselves like when they're first starting out in their career. So um, for you, so either either like when you're first starting out in your career or when you're first starting Mad Auntie, what's one piece of advice you would have given yourself? Learn how to do bookkeeping. (laughs) (laughs) Keep your receipts. Mm -hmm. Learn (laughs) learn how to um, write stuff off. Mm -hmm. No, um, I mean, that is all valid stuff, but like more on the creative side. um, Yeah, I guess maybe do more testing of products Mm -hmm. and designs. Cause I would just like make something, put it out right away. Cause I was so excited, but didn't actually yeah. like test it out, wear it around. How does it hang? How does it yeah. feel? <laughs> Is it too heavy? Right. So uh, those are all things that like I've been learning. Cause even though I design jewelry, I don't often wear it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's really important to learn how things hang, mm-hmm. how things fit on people's like necks and and so that's something I'm getting more into that now and especially mm-hmm. when designing rings I'm like oh my goodness um 
ring sizes and all of those things that I've had to teach myself because I never did go to jewelry school. Right. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm playing catch up with maybe stuff that is really obvious to jewelry designers that have been through a uh, formal education. Mm-hmm. So, and like, and things like, um, you know, the difference between uh, gold filled or gold plated. Right. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I'm mm-hmm. just learning, finding out this stuff every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. So, but I think like jumping in is fine too. Mm-hmm. But if I could tell myself to just like slow down, do more product research, material research before yeah. like getting really excited and putting stuff out, mm-hmm. I think that's yeah something I didn't think about at first. Yeah, no, that's definitely some some solid advice. I think, um, yeah, and getting other people's feedback too about mm-hmm. like how something feels to them when they're wearing it can be really valuable yeah. too because you know different things sit, sit differently on different bodies mm-hmm. and and all of that. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's something I think I'm now just like paying more attention to, and hopefully it'll just make my design stronger. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm definitely excited to see uh, to see what you have going on going forward my last question is I was wondering where you hope to take Mad Auntie and what are some of the plans you have for the brand going forward um after I get my studio set up for this spring I hope to launch a kind of summer collection which will be more like florals and Mm -hmm. bright colors um and then once I do a bit of more testing on the 3D designs. I'll be launching that as a pre-sale. Um, like I said, I, I do want to get into more uh, wear like clothing, um, accessories, um, mm-hmm. but that I think might not be for another year or two. Yeah. Uh, as I sort of learn about that world. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think just a, a few a few more collections coming out this year, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's really exciting, and I'm definitely um, looking forward to seeing them launch and everything. Um, so, just to wrap us up, where can listeners find you online, connect with you, and also with Mad Auntie, and check out your designs? Uh, yeah, so Mad Auntie's website is mad-anti.com mm-hmm. on instagram is at mad underscore anti underscore um mm-hmm. and then myself i have a website joytrcan.com for more of my visual arts practice um i do have a facebook and everything for mad anti but the main place is instagram okay so Instagram, everyone go check out Mad Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joy, for taking the time to chat with me. It's always nice to catch up. And um, yeah, and looking forward to seeing what you do with the brand. Thank you so much for tuning into the Fashion Ambition Podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure to leave a review. And if you got any great takeaways, I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and follow the podcast page at The Fashion Ambition to be updated whenever there's a new episode. I know that I always learn so much from each of the guests on the podcast and I would love to know what stood out most to you. So feel free to tag me on Instagram with a screenshot of this episode and let me know what you learned. Thanks again and see you in the next episode of The Fashion Ambition.